Well, hello. Uh, have a seat. Unless you'd uh, rather stand, take a, a mug full of piping hot tea in each hand. Settle down and relax. I won't keep you too long. You've got uh, illegal downloads to hurry along and much more to do. Uh, given how busy you are, to be honest, I'm thrilled that you've lasted this far. But enough about me and uh, about you. There's some serious business we've signed on to do. If you're wondering why I'll be speaking in verse, there are three reasons. One, it can't make things much worse. Secondly, it's a break from the dreary routine of watching me drone on in prose through each scene. But the reason above all of these, number three, is that this week our subject best suits poetry. It's a heroic ode, one of those cute techniques that was honed and perfected by long since dead Greeks. When telling of mighty achievements, then rhyme can be highly effective. Well, some of the time. And if you want to know what the meter is here, then it's called an apestic tetrameter, dear. So lie back, sip your tea, while I tell you a tale of a Nobel Prize winner. Yes, once again male, who was first to explain what for years no one knew why it is that the seas and the oceans are blue. It seemed simple at first, but for years went unsolved because there are quantum mechanics involved, which were first understood by a brilliant man named Sir Chandra Sekara Venkata Raman. With this ponderous name hanging over his head, it's small wonder he called himself C.V. instead. He was born in November 1888 in a town that's now in Tamil Nadu state. Pretty tough to pronounce, but we'll get there somehow. Trichinopoly then, Tiruchirappalli now. He learned all that he could from his physicist dad, and by 19 this C.V.'s C.V. wasn't bad. He'd a B.A. and M.A. and son of a beach he'd taken first place in his cohort in each. Then his father cried, son, time to put on your skates. The Indian Finance Department awaits. So this boy who loved nature and colour and sun had a job where excitement meant carry the one. His mathematical skill meant he soared through the ranks, but his heart was in physics and not in the banks. So what spare time he had, he'd devote to the lab, where the study of nature made life seem less drab. He'd give lectures as well to the public at large, and from what I can tell, they were all free of charge. He felt drawn to acoustics, the science of sound, and he studied in depth any instruments he found. He did groundbreaking work on the harmonics in both the Indian Veena and the West's violin, and he studied the tabla, and he mastered the thrum of the long-necked tambura and wide mridangam. When a decade had passed, he resigned from his post to pursue the career that he longed for the most. He'd been offered a job a prestigious one, too, as Palit Chair of Physics at Calcutta U. Four years into the role, with his colleagues impressed, he was chosen to go on a grand tour of the West. As he stepped on the boat in 1921, a new chapter had started for C.V. Raman. <laughs> While in Europe, he found himself struck by the hue of the Mediterranean singular blue, it was summer, and sunlight was sparkling on sea. This is my reconstruction of what he could see. From the deck of the SS Narkunda, he gazed at the deep cobalt waterscape, hushed and amazed. And he wondered why water had that azure tint, instead of being tangelo or a peppermint. Now, of course, he was hardly the first to ask why the colour of sea matched the colour of sky. And nine centuries earlier, Ibn al-Haytam, the renowned Arab polymath, seen here looking glum, had proposed, and this theory was thought to be true by da Vinci and others who seemed like they knew, that the sunlight reflected off dust in the air, giving rise to those colours we see everywhere. And a more nuanced answer was then written down just one year before Rahman was born in... that town. Future Nobel Prize winner Lord Rawley would claim that the air molecules and not dust, were to blame. He said that intensity should be compared to some number divided by wavelength squared squared. Now, before you switch off, all this means is that light with a much smaller wavelength will seem much more bright. And as blue light has wavelengths much smaller than red, 
This means we'll see more blue when the sun's overhead. But at sunsets or sunrises, when the sun's low, it's that small angle that helps explain the red glow. And when Raleigh was quizzed on the sea, he would cry, its own blue came about through reflecting the sky. But Raman wasn't certain. And back on the med, he felt less and less sure about what Raleigh had said. Now, while most of us would in our luggage have clothes, suntan lotion, a swimsuit, some books, I suppose, Raman wasn't like us. And so while on this cruise, he'd a pocket-sized spectroscope packed he could use. It's a tube that allows you to study the light that's reflected off water or crystals or Sprite. He did all that he could with his portable kit, but he needed more time than the trip would permit. So when he returned to Calcutta, he'd spend the next six years working towards this one end, with a host of assistants and colleagues and aides that he led like a general commanding brigades. Some of India's brightest were there in those years as a step on the road to their own great careers, like Srivastava, Ramdas, and Ramanathan, Sogani, the Rao's, and Venkateswaran. And the answer that Raman was longing to hear was that water itself made those colours appear, that the atomic structure of H2O meant that when sunlight was shone, bluish light would present. They tried dozens of transparent liquids, and lo, each produced its own colour. Raman 1, Raleigh O. But the light they gave off was no more than a gleam, one ten millionth as bright as the incoming beam. For while most of the light came out as it went in, just as Raleigh predicted to Raman's chagrin, there was this tiny fraction whose frequency changed, all because of how those molecules were arranged. So in glycerin, Sunlight was shifted to green, which in water turned blue. Well, more ultramarine. And the frequencies were the same distance apart in each liquid, whichever light shone at the start. It took five years for Raman to think this all through. I'm sorry it seemed so much longer to you. But till now, he'd used simple equipment and tools. He believed that superfluous gear was for fools. He would boast later on that he'd spent in his day just 200 rupees, circa 0.7k. He used sunlight, and at minus 22 lat in Calcutta year-long, there's no shortage of that. But by 1927, he needed more light, and a refracting telescope suited him just right. It was new, with a 7-inch lens, and yes, guys, in this case, the important criterion was size. But soon, that too was swapped for a mercury lamp, going up to 11 on a light-making amp. And with this new equipment, results were so good that the physics behind them could be understood. Now, I've used the word quantum already, and swore I'd explain what it meant if I used it once more. Something's quantum if it comes in lumps, like raw meat, or in units, like poetry's metrical feet. You can't fit 12.5 syllables in a line, so a poem is quantized, unlike this red wine. Here's another example, the best one I've got. While the pearls may be quantized, the necklace is not. So if energy is quantized, and trust me, it is, there are small indivisible units of fizz. Now these units are almost impossibly small, to the point where you'd think they don't matter at all. But for atoms, one quantum is quite a big deal. It will take them from silence to high girlish squeal. And these energy levels, from custard to kale, are like rungs on a ladder the atom can scale. They can only climb up if you give them an E. The E stands for energy. That can take them, for instance, from rung 2 to rung 3. But with less or with more, if it isn't exact, then it's wasted on them, and they won't interact. So when light from the sun hits a jar full of X, mostly there's nothing doing, and the light just reflects. But one photon in every 10 million, let's say, interacts with an atom in the aforementioned way. So the photon will go through an energy change, and as frequency is linked to the energy range, what comes out will be light of a different shade that the atoms of transparent liquid have made. As a similar process, observed with X-rays, had won Arthur H. Compton that year's Nobel Praise, the idea that the process extended to light in the visible spectrum 
just seemed to be right. And Raman's own experiments helped it to endorse the belief that quantum physics was on the right course. As R. W. Wood would remark at the time, this very long quote that I couldn't make rhyme. It appears to me that this very beautiful discovery, which resulted from Raman's long and patient study of the phenomenon of light scattering, is one of the most convincing proofs of the quantum theory. And so by 28, after nearly six years, he felt ready to share the good news with his peers. But the hard part had started. The fun in the sun now was over for Chandra Sekara Raman. And so in Bangalore, on the 16th of March, with his turban in place and his shirt laced with starch, he presented his findings and explained this effect which by now he had triple and quadruple checked. He raced back to Calcutta, and no sooner there than he dashed off a paper to send everywhere. Overnight he sent 2,000 copies abroad so the world would be forced to stand up and applaud. And indeed his results were confirmed right away, and a German called Pringsheim was tempted to say in an article published soon after, what luck, they should call it the Raman effect. And it stuck. Now, this wholly fortuitous act of PR set a chain of events off that stretched pretty far, for in Moscow, three weeks before Raman's address, these two Russians, named Landsberg and Mandelstam, yes, Landsberg and Mandelstam saw it themselves. But their lab books lay gathering dust on the shelves. For the night before Raman was in Bangalore, Mandelstam had a cousin who'd broken the law that he got out of prison. So his mind was elsewhere. And besides, they thought, what was the rush? Just compare that with Raman's delirious speed. And so when they at last went to publish, they were just two more men citing Raman's results. They got lost in the pile and resignedly went back to work. Meanwhile, Raman had been very quick to realize he was now in the running for the Nobel Prize. And determined to stake his own claim to fame, he asked others if they would put forward his name. He wrote letters to big shots like Rutherford and Bohr, who'd Nobels of their own that they'd won years before. And he asked them to nominate him for the prize, which they did pretty swiftly, to my great surprise. I think it's worth holding it there to explain it was a highly effective and clever campaign. In his letter to Bohr, the point he stressed is he should get it for India's sake and not his. And the Russians, and all of their colleagues, did not, and not one nomination was sent in support. And so in 1930, with thunderous speed, the physics recipient was quickly agreed. C.V. Raman had won it, the first Asian man in the sciences since the Nobel Prize began. And Raman was so certain they'd give him this chance, he'd booked two tickets to Stockholm, two months in advance. Nine years on from that first trip to Europe, he sailed back to claim his reward. He had fought and prevailed. While his snubbing the Russians is par for the course in a cutthroat domain where success trumps remorse, there was one other man who had slipped from his mind which, and let's put it mildly, seems rather unkind. That man was R.S. Krishnan, a colleague who co-wrote the paper with Raman, and many say so should have shared in the honour, but none came his way. Things must have gotten a little bit awkward that day. It was tough to forgive, and some never forgave, but Krishnan took such pain as there was to his grave. The impression this all seems to build of Raman is he wasn't, well, wasn't a very nice man. He appears to have had really quite a short fuse, and I don't know if pedant's a nice word to use, but it covers the facts as I found them. Let's just say that he wanted things done, and those things done his way. But those flaws to one side, you should be in no doubt he helped many a much younger physicist out. He was a powerful man, and he did what he could to use all of that power for India's good. And before World War II, when some great Jewish brains had been forced to flee Europe or die there in chains, he extended a hand to encourage them east. And though few took him up, he had offered, at least. He'd a good eye for talent, and he liked to surround himself only with the very best men around. 
He took care of them too, but woe lest they forget that they'd always remain in C.V. Raman's debt. But when he got to Stockholm, alone with his wife, he felt something that he would recall all his life. When the Nobel Award was announced, I saw it as a personal triumph, an achievement for me and my collaborators, a recognition for a very remarkable discovery, for reaching the goal I had pursued for seven years. But when I sat in that crowded hall and I saw the sea of western faces surrounding me, and I, the only Indian, in my turban and closed coat, it dawned on me that I was really representing my people and my country. I felt truly humble when I received the prize from King Gustav. It was a moment of great emotion, but I could restrain myself. Then I turned round and saw the British Union Jack under which I had been sitting, and it was then that I realised that my poor country, India, did not even have a flag of her own, and it was this that triggered off my complete breakdown. And so he campaigned for an India free of the British, as so many longed it to be. It's been said that with Gandhi and Nehru, he ranked as a hero whose efforts deserved to be thanked. But his ornery manner could make others sore, and he found himself pushed to one side more and more. For example, when Hindi was chosen to be the Indian national language, said he this would take them 200 years back. Why not choose the English that so many Indians could use? The annoyance this caused him became widely known, but in high circles, Raman was all on his own. And though he got one of the first Bharat Ratnas, the most prestigious honour that India has, Raman, now in his 60s, felt less and less keen to forgive than perhaps he might once well have been. And the story is told, though I've not had it checked, so I can't guarantee you this bit is correct, over what he perceived as a deliberate slight he resigned from the Royal Society. That's right, there's not many who do that, and I'll say once again, no one's sure about why, though we know how and when. He lived into his 80s, and breathed his last breath in his own institute, a dignified death. To commemorate him and his work, every year on the date the Roman effect first became clear, on the 28th Feb, India celebrates National Science Day in all 28 states. And a cute little anecdote, Raman's brother's son, a Chandra Sekhar, first named Subrahmanian, won a second Nobel for his family. That's like a million to one if you work out the stats. And the man has achieved a perpetual fame through that simple effect which still bears his name. Though for Russians, who've national pride to protect, it's the landsberg mandelstam Raman effect. But whatever you call it, it's used far and wide as a tool to see what things are made of inside. In laboratory settings, it's long been employed to take something apart that you don't want destroyed. As a physicist, Raman might not have been wild about it being chemistry's adopted child, but its life-saving uses to diagnose those with diseases like cancer aren't bad, I suppose. So the next time you come across the name Raman, don't assume that it's noodles misspelt. It's this man, who was first to explain how the sea got its blue. And if you're still awake, then... Uh, Goodbye and uh, thank you. Wow, what a relief that's all over. At last I can go back to talking the way I do normally. No need to speak so unusually formally. All of that poetry stuff's in the past. Wait a bit, can it be? Hasn't it stopped? Oh, this is terrible, wholly unbearable. That was an awful technique to adopt. Save yourselves, everyone. Quick, hurry up and run. This could be catching. You might not be safe. You two could speak like this. Have a technique like this, terribly weak like this, using nonsensical words that will rhyme, such as chafe. Run, or else woe betide. Go far away and hide. Click a link on the side and let it be your guide anywhere you decide. Quick, I won't be denied. Click, or I'll tan your hide. Why won't this curse subside? Why won't it end? I just wish it would go so that I could talk normally again and thank you for watching this video and encourage you to subscribe below for further updates. My friend.